said. I appreciate you. Thank you. I am not ashamed of you, and I will speak the truth. And David called upon the Lord, and the Lord God answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of God. Isn't that something? I am exploding with fire in me. I can feel it all over me. I, I really can. This train is running. It ain't going to stop. We can get those souls. <laughs> we can get those souls. Jesus Christ. He wants to possess us. Do you want to be possessed? It feels good to have paid the full price and to receive the full horn of the anointing of God. Oh, you think a lot of, I think a lot about Jesus. 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 That's what I think a lot about. Now I'm just to tell you something that you're going to have a hard time with. There's not a miracle to us in the human body that has been exempted. We have had it, we, I mean, even out to, from, from God guiding us to places when there's droughts and him showing us ancient wells and dig right here and they start digging and water falls out of the ground just like it did for Moses when he hit this rock. Man, that's wonderful, huh? And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about, man, multiplying food and, and I, limbs growing back and eyes popping in heads and uh, new brains and new hearts and new livers, new kidneys, new spleens. And, I mean, ooh, dead raisins. I mean, man, come on. Why do I want anything else? Because it's out there to be had if I can discipline myself to get it. Father, this day, I cry out to you, whatever the cost, whatever the consequence, Lord, in my life, in the lives of the leaders here, Lord, in the lives of all those in the revival, the lives of all those that have come here, God, send fire. Burn up that which is born of flesh. Burn up that which is sinful. Burn up that which will not pass the test on that day. That only that which is born from heaven will last. Send holy fire, refining fire, purifying fire. Send a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I feel like I barely scratched the surface of what God can do through my life. I feel sometimes I don't even know what it is to go after God, but there's something more. There's something that cries out. I want to be a threat to the devil. I, I, want, to, I want to see God get out of me the absolute maximum that's possible from a human life. I don't want to, I know when I stand before him, I know when I see Jesus, I'm going to wish I could have done more. I'm going to wish I could have served him in a more wholehearted way. I'm going after God as best as I know how, but there's something in me, a dimension I want to shift into. I want to be ablaze. I want to be a torch for God. Jesus said of John the Baptist, he was a lamp that burned brightly. Come on, guys. You want to be clothed in power? This is how. Peter didn't care about his soul on the water for those moments. Oh, it's because he had his eyes on Jesus and then he got his eyes on the waves. That's part of it. What was going on deep is that for those moments, he was blind to his safety. He didn't exist. Only that marvel walking on the water. And he said, oh, power. But as soon as his soul became dear to him, he lost it. He began to sink. Isn't that something? Oh, yes, it has to do with where his eyes were, but there's something deeper than that. It's because he sought to preserve his soul. The danger of his body, the opinion of his peers, the security of his finances, suddenly.
suddenly they became an issue. As soon as they become an issue, he sinks. When they weren't an issue and he didn't care about them, that's when he's walking on the water anyway. It's a paradox. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever would lose his life for my sake will save it. Self-preservation will block the anointing. But wearing the cross will let it flow. Father, we love you and we praise you and we exalt you. Lord, I thank you so much for the outpouring of your spirit. I pray, God, that you would visit us with fire. Visit us, change us today. Let your fire fall. Thank you. <laughs> Amy Carmichael had prayed a prayer, make me thy fuel flame of God. Jim Elliot expanded on it. God makes his ministers a flame of fire. Am I like God, deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of thy spirit that I may be a flame. Make me thy fuel flame of God. Wigglesworth said, oh, if God has his way, we should be like torches, purifying the very atmosphere wherever we go, moving back the forces of wickedness. To make my weak heart strong and brave, to live a dying world, to save. Oh, see me on thy altar, lay my life, my all, this very day, to crown the offering. Now I pray, send the fire. Father, we bow in your presence tonight. We pray that you'll be glorified in power. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray these things not as empty words. But let your eyes fire look at me tonight inside of me and see if it ain't so. I want you to be glorified in power tonight. The name of Jesus. Whoosh. By the Holy Ghost, not by the might of men, not by the rhetoric of the flesh, not by the intelligence of this world. Not by emotional manipulation, but by the sweet, pure, powerful, crystal, clear, holy Spirit of God. Let Jesus dance and rise up in this and shine away the darkness. Break the chains. If the wealth of God is His inner substance, then what was really going on when Jesus shed his blood? He had human blood just like you got human blood. The difference is his was pure, perfect blood. He had the DNA of God in it. The seed of a new nation. The real Adam. And we sing about the blood, oh, the blood of Jesus. Do you realize what the blood of Jesus is? Can you give something more intimate and sacred than your blood? I mean, in a covenant marriage relationship, a man gives his seed to a woman. That is, the, that is the peak of intimacy between a man and a woman. But there's a greater intimacy yet when a man gives his blood for a whole nation. That wasn't just a self-sacrifice. That was the deep of God inside his body. It was the wealth of his substance that he let out and poured out for you. It was very personal to him. And what about when God pours his spirit out? We say, we need another Pentecost. Show us your glory. Bring revival to our city. Do you realize you're asking God to bear his inner substance for you? And that it's a deeply personal and intimate act? Do you want to know why prayer is one of the great keys to revival? Because God wants to know, if you want me to pour out my deep, I want to know that you're willing to pour out yours. Because that's the kind of relationship I respond to. It's something deeply personal where we say nothing any longer will satisfy except the reality of the substance of God. You want me to respond to you with deep. I want you to respond to me with deep. Some of us are so cheap. Show us your glory. Do you just go sharing your intimate secrets with any passerby? Is God like a stripper? Unveil yourself, Lord. The veil of the church is the spirit and when we are not operating in the gifts we are undignified in the sight of God 
We are not wearing the clothing that makes us pure. Only when we have the veil of the Spirit, only when we're soaked in power and operating with a quick word, operating with healing by power, raising the dead, preaching in transformational power, only then are we clothed with the beautiful veil that attracts the Master. When we are not veiled or clothed with power to God, we are naked and we are not desirable. The beauty of the church is the clothing of the Spirit. Make no doubt about it, friend. The church is only beautiful when she's clothed in the Spirit. Friend, this ain't no show. This is the house of God. This is the place where hungry children eat at the table that God has prepared in the presence of His enemies. I hope you heard the word of the Lord tonight. Now you respond. All of you are going to have to go in even deeper than languages you don't know to groanings that are too deep for languages. And not just producing the sounds but focusing your inner eye on the Lord and saying, you are all that will satisfy me. You are all. And I am willing to put cries to my desires. No longer will we give our hearts to the things of this world. No longer will I be addicted to sports. I'm going to define my need in the presence of God. And out of that need, I'm going to cry from deep. Friend, and if it's not deep enough, then cry from deeper. And then you tell me if he does not respond. In Malachi, it says that God has a book of remembrance. And I think it would do you good before you go to bed every night this week to ask God, what did you put in your book this, this today from my life? Jesus Christ, even as a believer with all your words, they're either wood or hay or stubble or silver or gold or precious stones. Now let's visualize. We give a man over here $10,000 and he invests it in wood. The next man is given $10,000 and he invests it in hay. The next man has $10,000 and it's in stubble. The man over here has $10,000 and he invests it in gold. Wouldn't get much at $500 an ounce, would he? And the next man at silver, he wouldn't get too much at $12 an ounce. And the other man in precious stones. But when the fire goes through it, what do you have? All you have is that wood going down until you've got ashes, maybe up to your ankles. And that's all that is left. A man's life, all his ministry, it showed. Do you see the difference between the wood and the hay and the stubble and the silver and the gold and the precious stones? Wood, hay and stubble are above the ground. They catch the eye. Silver and gold and precious stones are below the ground. Nobody sees them. There's a lot of public ministry in that day that's going to go down in ashes, my brother. Every penny you earn since you became the property of Jesus Christ, you'll give an account of before God. Your life is wood. The fire's going to come. Hay, the fire's going to come to it. Stubble, the fire's going to come to it. But what is your life is silver and gold and precious stones. What is gold a sign of? Gold, I believe, there is, is a sign of our devotion to God. You wouldn't get much gold for $10,000 today. What happens when you burn gold? Nothing. All you do is change it from solid to liquid, but you don't reduce it. What's your devotional life this morning? Would you like Gabriel to hand me the book of your devotional life for the last month and read it to this fine audience? The gold is going to be tried to our devotional life. The silver, what is the silver? The book of Proverbs says the tongue of the just is as choice silver. Yes, every idle word you've spoken, even since you were saved, God has a kind of, you know, he doesn't need a tape recorder, but he has an eternal record of it. You know, the gossip, the slander, the criticism, the prejudice. Can you think of all those awesome words? Can you think of all the words we've preached? to thousands of people over the years and we're going to answer at the, and the fire is going to be put to them well will they be hay and stubble or, or will they abide the fire the fire shall try every believer's work silver, gold, precious stones what, what, what are the precious stones? well when I read that I think of the I, I think of the breastplate that was on the priest and he went into the holy place to pray 
with a breastplate on him. I've said it many times, I say it again this morning, that no man is greater than his prayer life. I don't care about his organization and his... Let me live with a man a while and share his prayer life and I'll, I'll tell you how tall I think he is or how majestic I think he is in God. I think again of a statement Dr. Tozer made to me once. He said, Len, you know what? He said, we'll hardly get our feet out of time into eternity and gaze on eternity before what we bow our heads in shame and humiliation and say, my God, look at all the riches there were in Jesus Christ. And I've come to the judgment seat almost a pauper. For God has not merely given us Jesus Christ, he's given us all things. And because there isn't enough joy in the house of God, we need entertainment. Because entertainment is a devil's substitute for joy. Because there isn't enough power in the house of God, people are always looking for the last scientific development and their hair, hair stands up when they see some fancy show on TV. When I see the church in the New Testament, they didn't have stately buildings, they didn't have paid evangelists, they didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have organization, they didn't come get on TV and beg. But I'll tell you what they did, they turned the world upside down. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. Most of our joy is clapping our hands and having a good time and then afterwards we're talking all the drivel of the world. Can he share his sorrow with you? If you're going to get mature in God, all the dwarfs around you will criticize and sneer at you and say you're trying to be holier than the rest of us, huh? You'll discover this, the men who have been most heroic for God have been the men with the greatest devotional life. I preach out of my heart all I believe and I die for it. But say, am I just a showman? What's my, what's my secret life like? You know, if we can't live as a different breed of people on this earth, we've no right to live here. We shouldn't be affected by changing customs or changing styles or changing opinions or whether the stock market goes up or down. We ought to live every day as though we come out of another world into this world with the power of that world upon us. To live and speak and move and have our being in Jesus Christ. Before all the saints of all the ages and you and I are to stand there alone on the dais and be judged for the deeds done in the body, for every aspect of our lives, for our praying, for our giving, for our living, for our talking. It's only one life to will soon be passed. Only what's done for God will last. And when I am dying, how glad I shall be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. No, it's not so simple to be a Christian after all. It's a majestic thing. We ought to live eternity conscious in time. It's going to be an awesome day with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Judge of Judges. You see, there's no possible, there's no possibility of any rehearsal. Because again, this is the final judgment. Can you see all the saints of all the ages? And Leonard Ravel is standing there before a God Christ whose eyes are full of holiness, where the place is breathing holiness, where there's all the majesty of an awesome God. And he reads the record of my poor life before all the saints of all the ages. Can you see the holy dead all lined up there? All the saints in the Old Testament, all the saints in the New Testament. It's not only true that we live in a world of bankrupt politics, we live in a world, and this is the most tragic of all, of a bankrupt church, God stamp eternity on my eyeball. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ and he shows his plan for me, the plan of my life as it might have been had he had his way, and I see how I blocked him here and I checked him there and I would not yield my will. Will there be grief in my Savior's eyes? Grief? Though he loves me still, would he have me rich and I stand there poor, stripped of all but his grace, while memory runs like a hunted thing down the paths I cannot retrace? Lord of the years that are left to me, I give them to thy hand. Take me and break me and mold me to the pattern that thou hast planned. Let's look at all the apostles and all the saints of all the ages. There's Finney, look, there's Finney the, uh, with his amazing revival. There's William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. Uh, there's John Wesley. Here are all the great heroic figures. We've all read about them. And here they are all watching while, while the book is handed down. And, and somebody's going to read the record. When God opens that book of intercession, when he puts the fire to their prayer life, their devotional life, I'll tell you what, there'll be nothing lost. It won't be wood, it won't be hay, it won't be stubble. Not concerned about human opinion, not asking for more to spend prodigally on ourselves. But say, oh God, I want these, this life of mine adjusting so I, when I stand in your awesome presence, as James says, we shall not be ashamed of his appearing.
There's going to be no free crown. Any, any candidates here for the martyr's crown? There's going to be no free glory up there. I'm embarrassed to death when I read Hebrews 11. I can read Hebrews 11 every day of my life and weep. I can turn my Bible over at the back. I can read the map at the back of my Bible and weep. Look what the Apostle Paul did. He had no plane, no jet plane. He had no automobile. Look how it, look at his missionary journeys. No wonder he says, in perils of the deep, in perils of my countrymen, in perils of labors, in prison, in the first 50 years of Wesley preaching, the men that joined up with him as preachers died at the average age of 32 years of age. They were burned out for God. America is not dying because of the strength of humanism. It's dying because of the weakness of evangelism. We're not taking, we take people to the cross. We don't get them on the cross. The devil says, come down from the cross and save yourself. Why do you weep while other people are laughing? Why do you fast while other people are having a whale of a time? It's stupid, it is. Except in the light of eternity, it is isn't. The holiest man that ever lived was the most abused. Do you expect better treatment from this world than he got? What are you shrugging up in that little church for? Because it never hurt you to go. Because nobody fasts, nobody prays, nobody weeps. Your preacher's dry-eyed, he talks. How in God's name do they do it? You see, you have to account for your time. So here you've got three. You live 24 hours a day. You work eight, eight hours a day. You sleep eight hours a day. What do you do with the other eight? Put that into years. You live 60 years. You sleep 20 years. You work 20 years. What do you do with the other 20? It's not how long you live, it's how you live that matters. There are more decisions for Christ these days than ever in history, but never a fewer disciples. They were stoned. How long did it take them to die? They were destitute. These are saints. These are men filled with the Holy Ghost. They, not one, they were stoned. They were sawn asunder. According to tradition, Isaiah was hung this way with his feet strapped up there and sawn down the middle. Not with an electric saw, get it over with a wooden saw. It was sawn in pieces. The best title for the church of God today, in my judgment, is this. We're unbelieving believers. Somebody someday will pick this Bible up and be simple enough to believe it, and when they do, we'll all be embarrassed. Can you remember the last time you didn't go to bed because men were dying without Christ? Can you remember the last time you pushed the plate away and said, No, I, I want more time with God? Have you geared your life like that? Are you living, trying to be spiritual and living on the carnal plane? Are you trying to be spiritual and living in time? Are you trying to be spiritual and keeping up with other people round about? Listen, when God can get men that are sold out to him like Paul was sold out to him, we'll move our generation. God is saying, who will go for us? He looks for a man, not a cherubim, not a seraphim, not a half man and half deity. He looks for men. God takes men, not money, not methods, not machinery, not movement, men. When I can say, Lord, I'm concerned, I'm concerned, I'm, I'm speeding on to eternity. Look at my ministry, look at my life, look at my fruitlessness, look at my dry eyes, look at my poor spirit that has no ache in it. The men that die by the million, they're damned and lost. Look at me. Supposing you just ask God to show you one thing this afternoon. You, you get round, but you don't wear worldly things, you don't do this, you don't do that, all right, you'll get by. Listen, will you tell me this? Will you tell me? And if you tell me this, I'll tell you how spiritual you are. Can you tell me how much you pray a day? I declare in front of these people in the name of Jesus Christ, I depend so much on you. Lord, my best moments in the spirit were when I, I was clueless, weak and empty, and I threw myself at you. I declare that publicly, Lord, I'm the nobody. I'm worthless, and in fact, not only am I ineffective, but I'm harmful if I were to speak or do in the name of Jesus without the anointing of God. 
So Lord, let the gift of grace be upon us. Let the virtue and the fruit of the blood of Jesus, the seed of God, bear in this place upon us. Oh, how I pray for the strong arm of the Lord to flex his muscle, to wield the sword, to send the fire, to bang like a hammer and impress on our hearts. Oh, I pray from beginning to end, top to bottom, this evening, this people, supernatural of your spirit, anointed, planted seed. Lord, I speak now as an oracle of God because you've charged me to, but only in the spirit for the glory and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost, fire! Woo! Publish the Bacabade! I am on fire tonight! I got angels all around me, I can feel them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now what does that mean? What's the impact of that? That means he owns us. That means he possesses us. Not just where he can tell us what to do and we'll do it because we're owned by him, but that he'll make his abode in us. That's apostolic. Not building our house for him to visit, but building his house for him to live in. I call on the name and the powers of my God to uphold my words, which are His words. I pray this will be a revolution. I pray it will be deep and wide in the Holy Ghost. I pray for you that there shall be a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Woo! I pray there will be a difference from now on. Possession. When God possesses a people, that people then becomes the apostolic fulfillment of the apostolic burden which is this the fullness of Christ I'm looking for a house in which I can just be myself and not just act in accordance with your little system of decorum so as soon as I cross the bounds into my own freedom you put up religious restrictions that's because I'm only visiting your house that's revival build me a house after my own image and I'll possess it revolution and I declare that the devil does not like what's going on in this room but something's happening because the spirit of God's on me what are you threatened with when you're dead that's total freedom and that is the call of God because a revolution must be led by a revolutionary and a revolutionary is sold to the death the key of David is the willingness to live or die in protest to the law of sin and death. From now on, a revolutionary is this. Every aspect of your life is lived in protest to the law of sin and of death. Friend, if you're not dead, but you still want to seek God, that's witchcraft trying to manipulate on some other basis besides the loyalty that God demands in the first commandment. I pray for you in Jesus' name that God will bless you and come to you and give you confidence and strength and take your fears away. I pray that you'll rise up in this hour. This is the day of His power and you shall volunteer freely. I pray the grip of God will come on you and you'll do things that you can't do. I pray that God's sovereign grace will overshadow you and things will just start to happen and lead the way. And that what we pray for with passion, we will accept by faith today and you will be changed. Luke 10, verse 3. First word in my Bible says, go. If it's not sense of God, it won't be in the fullness of God got to have divine origin. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes. Greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. Friends, you, you own nothing. That's surrender. That's why with such freedom and ease, he can give the simple instruction, heal those in it who are sick. Just heal them. Well, what about, oh, yeah, and it doesn't always happen. Oh, I just pray for them and just trust you, right? No, you don't pray for them and trust me. Heal them. Just as easy as I tell you not to carry a purse, that it's the same ease I tell you to heal him. 
If you're walking, he's saying, in new covenant reality, you have dominion restored to you. The threat to new covenant dominion is not the devil, it's the flesh. And then the flesh lets the devil in. Half of our own person can be counseled by the Lord, the other half counseled by the devil. That's why we have so many Christians with devils. Because we got so many Christians with flesh that's not crucified. And that's why we need such unique deliverance sessions that interview them for three days, finding out what level of masonry is sticking on them. What on earth is this? Jesus became a curse for us. It is not the need of interviewing deliverance sessions. It is the need of a gospel that is true, yes. that has guts, and that is real. Yes. Praise Jesus forever. I've given you authority. I am restoring the human race. I'm restoring them to the image of God. It is not human to be ruled by a demon. It is not human to be ruled by depression. It is not human to be ruled by sickness and disease. We are meant to be ruled by nothing, nobody, nowhere, except for God Almighty himself, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Lord, his Son, and the great and mighty, wonderful, gentle, all-powerful hurricane, Holy Ghost. But it's about time we start taking dominion where we are supposed to take dominion and start walking this earth like Christians, like believers in Jesus who redeemed us not just so we would not go to hell, but he redeemed us to restore who we are. I say to you, paralytic, rise up and walk. It's not just human to be forgiven of sin. It is human to raise the dead. Because death is an enemy, a creature lower than our feet. Cancer is an enemy, a creature lower than our feet. And the devil that causes it are powers that are creatures lower than our feet. So for him to redeem us means to restore us to dominion over these animals. And at the end of that passage it says, They glorified God! Now that is the point of a man taking authority. The response is you giving glory to God. Not giving glory to you but giving glory to God. That's why men take dominion by the blood of Jesus. So God gets the glory because we have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. Only when we take dominion is God glorified properly. Only when we exercise our authority as believers in Jesus Christ is he glorified. Well, you know, that really feeds into pride. No, it doesn't. Pride exalts self. Humility exalts God. Pride says, pride says, oh no, not little old me. That's pride. Humility obeys. If you obey, it will require self-death. That's new covenant. We can be possessed of God and walk in authority. I have given you authority. It is time to rip away the veil of shame that is there because of pride and shine with the authority that I've given you. Trust me, he says, it will take all the humility you could possibly have to shine the way I want you to shine. It takes humility and death to operate in the kind of power God wants us to operate in. Give God the glory because that's the nature of your dominion. Are you hearing that part? The nature of our authority is to give glory to God. When a human being is dead, giving all glory to God by taking dominion, then God gets the fame and the attention for being God. Why are you looking at us as if something in us we made this man whole today? It's the God of your fathers who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, who made this man whole before you today. Listen, as far as I'm concerned, we can walk, we're all, we have the authority. 
It's not when you die you have the authority, it's when you die you can relate to the authority you already have. It's not when you die you get the authority, you've already got the authority. It's when you die you relate to it and it flows. I say let's go for it together. Not, uh, not in dominion for us, but in dominion for him. I have given you authority. Let's let God into the deep. And start walking in dominion. Start walking in joy. Start walking in peace. Holy Kababayete. Oh God, let the fire come. I wrote a question there, what will the 21st century hold? Maybe there'll be a time all over North America and with people, teams sent out from here all over the world. Maybe there'll be a time of people preaching radical messages and living radical lives filled with radical power, making a radical impact, blazing with fire and setting people and cities and nations on fire. Maybe it'll be different. That's a strange sight. When you see one of these gorgeous cathedrals and, and it just can seat 150 or 200 people, you think, what in the world is it for? What is church? I can't believe for a split second it's the will of God that we build these multi, multi million dollar buildings and fill them once or twice a week for a lovely meeting. We can get rid of this foul notion, which is an unscriptural notion of going to church, as opposed to understanding that it's a matter of being the church. Lord, what does it mean? How do we live it out? How do the walls come down? I cannot relate to the American dream. I cannot relate to the mentality of just having a nice, happy life. The primary reason for lack of opposition and the primary reason for lack of persecution and the primary reason for lack of resistance is because we are toothless and ineffective. But when we get empowered and filled with fire and shake things up and drive back powers of darkness, all hell will break loose against us. And that's when Jesus said, rejoice! Some of us will have the privilege of shedding our blood for the gospel. Some of us will have the privilege of being raised up to high places in society and being influential. But either way, we live and breathe for one thing. God, I've got to make an impact. Before I close my eyes and say goodbye to this world, I've got to change things. I don't understand how else we can think. What else is the purpose of our life? I don't care what the calling is, whatever it is, our mentality must be the same. There's nothing else that makes any sense. Jesus came into the world to change the world, period. There was one purpose. He was going to go to the cross and die and rise from the dead and send his spirit on those he had called out and equipped so we could go and follow in his footsteps and make a difference. We must take hold of it afresh. We must consecrate ourselves afresh. We must eat it and live it and breathe it and think it and sleep it. We are here to do the will of God, period. We are here to make a difference, period. And everything else is secondary. Whatever God gives us in this world is so that we can go and set the world on fire. Jesus, the revolutionary who came to overthrow the status quo and set up the kingdom of God and drive back the powers of darkness and said, leave everything and follow me. all over America with thousands and thousands of young people gathering together. Some may be planned for a few hours or last a few days. Some may be planned for a night or last a week. God just coming people worshiping and seeking his face and, and called right then and there to leave everything and go out and train and get on the field. We've been born for this hour. We've been made for it. On to Calvary. On to death for the world. Let us not refuse the smiters. No halting. No rest. On suffering, sorrowing, weeping, dying for God and men. Till the hosts of hell fly from their last defense and we march on over a burning world into everlasting glory. Jesus, the revolutionary who came to overthrow the status quo and set up the kingdom of God and drive back the powers of darkness. Everything in us that's of man that's not planted of heaven, root it out. Some of us will have the privilege of shedding our blood for the gospel. There's nothing else that makes any sense. God, I've got to make an impact. Before I close my eyes and say goodbye to this world, I've got to change things.
For the only thing that pleases God is what He does Himself. All things are from You and through You and to You. To You be all the glory. Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. And His name is the name above every name. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He is most definitely the Son of God, the only begotten. And He is the Son of Man. And we know Him as such. The child of the perfectly divine, Himself eternal. And the child of humanity. Fulfilling what Adam lost. Fulfilling what was incomplete in David's kingship. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son. And to say that He's the Son is not just to say He's fully divine. It means He relates to God a certain way. As a son would to a father. And that's His heart. He's saying, oh, if you can enter in to a sonship like I have, you will be as invincible as I was on the earth. You can be forsaken of men and disappointed by earthly fathers and still be whole. He's saying, you think as charismatics and Pentecostals that the Holy Spirit is for your, your super duper worship services. It's the Spirit who makes us sons of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Not what your earthly fathers have said. Not what your whining friends are saying and complaining about. Don't depend on man. Do you want to be supernatural or not? Do you want to depend on men even in an apostolic thing? Or are we going to do this right from the get-go? By the Spirit. Man, I like the Holy Ghost. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revelation of the Son. Creation is not waiting for the revelation of a charismatic movement that will contribute to a greater whole. When we come into a sonship, then we glorify God in the way He wants to be revealed to us. Do we dare speak as though we can relate to God the Father the way Jesus did? We have the same spirit. He says, if I stay physically proximate to you, you can't experience what I did. Do you really believe it's to your advantage he goes away physically? Do you really believe that God gave you something better than that? By giving you your own relationship to the Father, to the Spirit, in the name of the Son? It is not a work that we have that has anything to do with making good in this world. It has everything to do with another age, another realm, another kingdom. And everything they do and put in the context of the return of Jesus Christ. Period. He is coming back. And that and that alone is the framework of your life. Not what you can accomplish in the eyes of men, but the revelation of Him in fire at the end of the age. And what that event reveals in our lives. That is the context in which we should live every day and pray and raise our kids and preach to God. When the church loses her grip on the reality of eternity and everlasting life, she will lose her motivation to work or she will exchange her motivation for something carnal and worldly. Of all people, we should be absorbed, fascinated, motivated by the reality that this age and everything about it is already decaying passing away and is worthless with all of its grandeur and its splendor with all of its facade of everlastingness eternality just being in New York and seeing all the flash and the pictures the, just the way people look on a you know on a big screen television in the middle of the sea or the, the pride and the arrogance the fakeness and the falsehood that you just see on these little things you see on the, the airplane when the screen comes down and they're they're interviewing entertainers like they're gods. Look at the impression they're trying to give. This is what is forever. This is of lasting quality. I'm thinking to myself, every last bit of what they're doing, even their bodies, even the beauty on their faces, with all the cosmetics that make them look the way they look. And even if they're naturally beautiful, one day, if they don't, if they don't die completely wrinkled and decayed, after here, that body's trashed anyway. It gives the impression that this is what lasts forever. But of all people, we should be thoroughly bathed in the reality that everything about this life, even your body, will not last. Do you live that way? It is slipping away quickly. This age is a runaway train going to a certain doom. Do you know this? He's coming back and his reward is with him, and his kingdom will be with him, and everything you did for him on that day, that is what you'll have 
forever. And everything you did for him that was not for him or not from him will die. You'll never see it again. So the question is, do we live our lives and work our ministries and what we do in light of eternity, in light of the return of the Lord, the judge? Or have we been tricked by this age, its facades of long-lastingness that in fact is nothing but a facade, it's nothing but a fake. It is going to be one of the most sobering, deeply challenging, shocking moments of the day of the Lord. It's coming. Every one of us will stand before God and give an account. And everything we did that is wood, hay, and stubble will burn. And I'm telling you, there are people in this room right now who've spent much of their lives in dead works. Your accomplishments are going to burn. Because there are things you are doing, things you're even praying or not praying, that are not from the Spirit, they are from the flesh. They are religious. And if you don't like hearing about it now, just wait till Judgment Day. Jesus is coming back. And this life and the religious system is trying to find a way to glorify the temporary beauty of this life and call it eternal. Don't buy it. Be in love with His appearing. Live for eternity. Do you long and groan for that day? Or is it barely even a consideration? According to the New Testament and the consistency and the frequency of its witness to this age, it should be the norm to meditate on these things, to be motivated by these things, and to work toward the goal of these things, and to groan for them. Therefore, I pray for me, and I pray for them, that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in the things that belong to Him. That by gift, by grace, you will insert into our heart and just put it in there like something that... It gets inserted in and then expands what's in, what's in there. Eternity. Values tax on eternity. Choices based on eternity. Prayers motivated by eternity. A loss in this life, even if things dear, because eternity is real. We want to be motivated by the beauty of your kingdom. By the fact that we will live with you, enjoying the things that we do through the cross. So the whole purpose of creation from this text is that there would be a platform for a phenomenon called the church. And that that church would have something to fulfill, for which reason God did not think it extravagant to create all things. And that purpose has nothing to do explicitly nor directly with the benefits that would come to men through the church or to the nations or to the church itself. Rather, it's to make a demonstration of something called the manifold wisdom of God to some dimension of reality that is above the world and invisible called the principalities and powers of the air. And that this is the eternal purpose of God in Christ Jesus. This is staggering. It's contradictory. It pulls the rug out from under our seat, our feet and provides a purpose that we had never once ever considered Paul says is the very reason for all creation. What kind of a church is it that could go on from generation to generation and never once consider and take to heart seriously God's purpose for all creation, for which reason he has established the church? We promote our programs and consider our activity independent of this central purpose for our being as church. I want to say that the church that gives scant attention to this, that chooses to ignore it, or to th that dismisses this as some kind of euphoric play on words that is nice to hear, but not to be taken seriously, is ipso facto not the church. It's an institution. It's a band of uh, enthusiasts who are uh, uh, itching to promote their own ministries to perform things that they think to please God. It's not a church that is concerned with that which pleases God according to his own definition and according to his own word. God thinks it important, he doesn't explain why, that a certain demonstration be made 
by the only agency on earth that can conceivably make it, and for which reason he's created the earth, that it could sustain this phenomenon called the church. And that purpose is for that church to demonstrate to this invisible realm of principalities and powers, whoever they are, the manifold wisdom of God. And that is the eternal purpose of God in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Only if we are occupied with the eternal can we be of any significance in the now. A church that is only occupied with now, that gives scant attention to those things that are eternal, is strangely and ironically irrelevant. If you want to be left alone, just ignore this text. You want to go on with business as usual and promote your individual ministries? Just ignore this. And then they will say, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? You're not even worthy of our consideration. That, own, that church that requires our attention and that causes us a stark fear is a church that does not have to have a payoff and receive a benefit for taking to itself a purpose in God. Even if that purpose threatens a consequence that will be painful. All the more is that very willingness itself the demonstration of that wisdom. Because there are two wisdoms in collision. And you need to understand that in this context, Paul is not talking about wisdom as cleverness or wise procedure or behavior on the basis of knowledge or experience. Maybe the better word for the kind of manifold wisdom that God is wanting made known is a, way, a value, a system of values, a way of understanding. There's a collision between value systems. One orig originates from below and has the Prince of Darkness as its author, and the whole world is enveloped and taken up with it, and never once questions its truth or legitimacy. For example, take care of number one. If you don't, who, who will? Uh, seek your own self-interest. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, the self-evident truth of the pursuit of happiness as being the commendable purpose for human existence. Avoid suffering and pain, pursue pleasure. Seek and take care of yourself. Avoid uh, loss, uh, sacrifice. The wisdom of this world by which the whole world lives its life. It sounds rational. It's reasonable. It's addressed to the self-evident needs of men to put themselves first. It's an appeal to self-interest. It's an appeal to self. So what about a church that is willing to adopt something as central to its whole purpose for being that offers no promise of any reward to itself? No advantage, no blessing, but on the contrary, that this will mock you before these powers because you're a people of such a kind as to put the eternal purpose of God before every other purpose. So you're willing even to suffer the opposition of the principalities and powers because you want to see the eternal purpose of God fulfilled, even though it offers no prospect of improvement or betterment or blessing, but only trial, opposition, persecution? That is the wisdom of God. And only those who have a concern for the heart of God and the satisfaction of that heart will make his purpose their own. And that is the church. Instead, the church is itchy, wanting to find something to do. It has to have a program, needs to justify its existence, precisely because it does not, does not see its existence in any other terms, but in responding and meeting the things that are immediate and about them. It has not seen what would have given it security and foundation in God, namely the taking up of the eternal purpose. It would have freed it from the necessity and the itch to do and to perform. Something that proceeds and is greater than doing and performing is being. If you want to appropriate the ascension, if you want to go up high and fly and be the real thing, then you have to do like your master did and go down also into death, but not be kept there. That's the secret of Jonah, or the descent into the lower region. Or the testimony of the psalmist who came out of nowhere and said, I was like dead, but God brought me back. And that's the very stone rejected but chosen by God. That thing that is rejected by men goes into the heart of the earth, into some kind of death, but comes back out 
That's when the gates of Hades come. You can't just go up to the gates of Hades and start saying, I rebuke you, I bind you. You're not going to win. That's not a testimony. You've got to go in. Then you come out and say, ha ha, the Lord has chastised me, but he didn't leave me in death. I'm alive. And I'm coming into a new set of gates. When we die, but are not kept in death, that's the church that makes the ascent. That's the church against whom the gates of Hades will not prevail. You've got to go into the belly where Jonah went and pray that your only hope is God. Then, bust back out of the gate. Right, John? Out of the gates from the inside out. Jesus says, that's my church. They go in the way the master went in. And then they're out. That's the rock. Because rejection is death. And only that stone that's been cast into the heart of the sea, swallowed by a sea monster, and then belts back up. That's the stone that becomes the chief core. Yeah. Now we know the rhythm of the sun. He dies, he rises. And it's just kind of like you stick with him, keep the faith, and he does the rest. That's the trick of death the resurrection. Jesus said, that's the church. The dead thing that comes back. That's the church. Do you want to appropriate authentic community? Peter says, oh no, that's not for you. Jesus says, you are Satan. Get behind me. You're a stumbling block. Get out of the way. Do not stumble over that one thing that makes authentic church. Death. Because you cannot conquer death unless you die. What is death? It began in the belly of a sea monster. No such thing as achieving anything authentic unless we actually experience everything being against us. But everybody's saying, I'm not everybody. I'm the king. You want to do the real thing? You follow me against everyone else's counsel. That'll be your death. Are you willing for it? Yes, I am. It's about time I believe for something when I feel the pressure. He was speaking like he was in another world. No matter what anybody said, I'd go back to him. You're doing just fine, Robert. Used to focus on what you focused on. Don't jump ahead. I'm like, the pressure's on. Jesus said, die. Who will go up to Mount Zion? Those who've been purged in death. Clean hands. Pure heart. Not swearing deceitfully. Not lifting up a soul in falsehood. Yes! Purity, integrity, the virgin. That's the one that seeks the face. That's the, the procession of pilgrims. The righteous that come out of death. That is the testimony of one who died but is back. Let us deliberately enter into this. There is the wrong kind of leadership in the body of Christ in most places. But unless there's an actual fivefold leadership, the lordship of Christ will somewhere be gone. Because these roles defy the world system. They go another way. They're not official. They're not appointed. They're not like this, this official thing, the big CEO of, of the company. That's not what they are. They're, they're gritty. They bring a revelation of Jesus. They actually have spiritual authority. There's something there in their words to bathe people, to influence people, to correct people. They can release discipline with their words. These things must be present or the Lordship of Christ is not. I believe the Lord's giving us license now. I believe He's saying you've come to a place you're ready to start this real thing in a way you weren't before. Go for it. these heroes that we read about, that we put out of sight and out of mind as something distant and heroic and greater than us, these passages of scripture are trying to tell us, don't you understand that history is pointing to you? And these heroes were not serving themselves, but you. What did they do? What did they do on the earth by the power of God? By the supernatural? How did they manifest heaven? How did they manifest the personality of God? How did they show forth the world what it looks like to have a man or a people filled and clothed with God? They conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness remained strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. 
Women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, people of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. What is it about these people that we can say in the Holy Spirit, the world was not worthy of these people and they're dead? The world was not worthy of people who do not exist anymore. What is it he's trying to say about them? All these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us. So that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. They were too good for the world. And they weren't even the end of what God was trying to do through them. They were too good for the world, but they weren't the best. But in fact, we're waiting for some generation, some time, to finish what they started. So here's a picture of Jesus Christ standing as the pioneer of all of them. No matter where you place him in time, he is the pioneer of what it is to be a man of God in the earth. And he came and lived as the great man of faith, the, the perfect manifestation of what it means to be a person of God without flaw. He came, lived that way, and then surprised everybody, he left. And now just like the prophets that were all behind him, he left apostles and generation after generation after generation that were building to one final generation. That would be the mystery of the gospel. And they're all standing there, friend. They're all standing there looking at you. They've been playing for three and a half quarters. Now they're putting in the last bunch. And they're saying, if you don't do it, what we did was in vain. So Jesus is standing there at the beginning of a company, just like this. Oh, there he's standing there, physical, all his world. And behind him, there's a band of people that stretches all throughout history. And he stands at the beginning of it like a pyramid that's on the ground. And the rest of them just span all the way out. And they're just standing there, all facing the same direction. Friends. They're facing one generation. They're facing one generation. They're facing one generation. They're facing one generation. What is the mystery of the gospel? What is the letter X that they're looking at? What is that letter X that will finally show the world after all of these years? From the beginning when, from the beginning when Adam fell and faith began. From the very beginning, what is the mystery of the gospel that will finally be revealed? What is the generation letter X that all these prophets and apostles and Jesus Jesus himself are looking at to find out what it's going to be. Friend, it is you. You are that generation. You are the mystery of the gospel. The expression of the people of God always intended but never manifested. Now is the time. You are the mystery of the gospel. You are the revelation of what God always intended, but never saw it through. A nation could be born in a moment. If there's one generation that will finally show the fullness, all generations will be, will be tagged victorious for the church and a loss for the devil. I don't care how long she's been sick. I don't care how long she's been in the coma. I don't even care if she's trying to wander her way down the hall with her IV pole. If she wins in the end, she wins. And if the devil loses in the end, no matter what the victories were up to that point, he loses everything. Guess what? You are the end.